I'm also joined here in Newport by the leader of UKIP, Gerard Batten. Uh, good Hello, morning. Chris. Nice to see you. Um, can I ask you, um, Gerard, how's UKIP doing at the moment? Neil mentioned that um, our, our uh, members had dissipated after the referendum. Are they starting to come back? Well, we had a long decline after 2016. We went off the boil. Instead of talking about how we should leave the European Union, we, we kind of did nothing. Uh, then we had, uh, we've had a number of leaders since, uh, three I think <laughs> since then, um, and of course we had the disaster of uh, the leader prior to me. Uh, we, were, we, re we were falling off the edge of a cliff in February 2017. Membership was pl plummeting through the floor. We went down to a low of about 17,000. Uh, we were basically approaching insolvency when we'd have had no money, had to dismiss all the staff at the head office and wind the party up. Um, I took the job on because nobody else would do it. Since then we've seen a complete reversal in fortunes because of the kind of things that I was doing, being helped by the people that have helped me, the chairman, the deputy leader, the staff at HQ and a whole host of other people. What we've done is we've now uh, re-established our finances, we've got more than enough money coming in to cover our administrative costs, we have reconstituted the patrons club with about income of about 130,000 a year, adding to the things that we need to pay for. We've got a massive um, election campaign fund being built up, it's now well over about 120,000 pounds, money's coming in all the time. So financially we're in a very strong position and in terms of membership we've now edging up to, and we may have passed it this weekend, the 28,000 mark and I want our next step to be 50,000. And I don't see any reason why UKIP shouldn't be a mass movement of 100,000 members. And certainly in the next year or two, that is where I'd like to see UKIP going. And who are we appealing to? Which, which parts of the population are we aiming that, that membership drive at? I want people to join UKIP who are patriots, who love their country, who care about their country, who want sensible, pragmatic, common sense policies for their country. And it doesn't matter whether they've come from the Conservative Party or the Labour Party. We might even get a few from the Lib Dems, who knows? And there's a large number of people out there who've never belonged to a party before who are now joining UKIP. So we want across the board membership. The only qualification for joining UKIP is that you're a patriot, you love your country. You want free, freedom, uh, sorry, uh, trade, friendship and cooperation with all the other countries of the world. And we want to re-establish government in our country under our own laws, elected by our own democratic parliament, that we can dismiss when we have an election, unlike the European Commission that we can't sack. Now you put two words together there, democratic and parliament. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and those two jar a little bit well, these days. And I'll tell you why. Because what we've had now, and it has now been shown up to be totally dysfunctional, is the first-past-the-post system. What do you get? It's, it's really a conspiracy between Labour and Tory to make sure that they stay in and everybody else is kept out. You have a parliament elected on a minority of votes. I don't know the exact vote figure for the last election, but certainly the Electoral Reform Society has done figures in the past where it shows that about... 65% of the votes cast in a general election actually don't elect anybody. And you've got MPs elected sometimes on as low as 30 odd, 40% of the vote. So 60% of the votes in a constituency are not electing anybody. Now that cannot be right. First past the post was justifiable when you had a two party system or you had a two and a bit party system with the old Liberals, Liberal Democrats. What we've got now is a multi party system and we need to see urgently introduced a proportional representation system so that people get the MPs they voted for in the proportion they voted for them. Now can you imagine if we'd have had that in the last general election and you'd have had 20, 30, 40 UKIP MPs elected we would now be in coalition with somebody in Parliament to actually deliver the kind of Brexit that people voted for in 2016. So top of our priority list now is proportional representation. I know Parliament isn't going to give us that to us overnight, but the more people that vote for us, the more we put pressure on for that. So even if you're previously not a big UKIP supporter, think to yourself, what kind of country do you want to live in? If you want PR, vote for UKIP, as well as all the other reasons for voting for UKIP. Now you've talked about half of Parliament, you've talked about the House of Commons, what about the House of Lords? Abolish it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They are even a bigger set of Remainers than 
the MPs themselves, and at least the MPs were elected. Nobody elected Parliament. It's a bunch of place men and women who have been put there because they've donated to a political party or they've been yes men and yes women for a political party for their entire year. Or well, now we have kind of celebrities in there as well, don't we? Uh, so I would get rid of the whole lot, completely reform it. My own view is that we do need an amending and scrutinising second chamber. So you have to think about what its function is and what it's supposed to do. But we need people elected to that parliament, uh, sorry, to that second chamber, again, under a proportional representation system. And I'd like to see more and more kind of ordinary people in there because they're the ones that have to pick up the bill. When parliament produces a, a law that go, is, goes through the House of Lords for scrutiny, it should be looked at by people who think, hang on a minute, I've got to pay the taxes to pay for this. Is it something that I really want? Is it going to benefit the country at large? What's wrong with it? How do we change it before sending it back to Parliament for, a, for uh, you know, to be subsequently passed into law or not? So I would like to see that chamber much more representative of ordinary people who are the ones that have to pick up the bill for all this at the end of the day. And of course, <clears throat> one of the bills that uh, everybody has to pick up is £154.50, I think it is at the moment for a television license. That's another thing. Thank you for prompting me on that, Chris. Uh, I mean, I personally don't mind paying a television license for a channel that doesn't have any adverts. You know, it would save me well. keep putting the mute button on. Uh, and BBC used to produce lots of fantastic programmes when I was a boy growing up. You know, I got a lot of my education from the BBC. But what I resent paying for and don't want to pay for now is this endless stream of pro-EU, politically correct, Marxist propaganda that's poured out on the news channels and indeed uh, colours many of the drama programmes that they put out. And I think that now has gone beyond the pale and I, we want to abolish the uh, licence fee so that the BBC becomes a subscription service and therefore people can choose what, whether they want to pay for it or not. And when you've got customer choice involved, they will be forced to change their agenda because people won't be buying it. Because I know, for a fact, I do meetings all around the country, and every, every time I go to a meeting now, several hundred people, I say, how many people here watch less of the mainstream media than they did in 2016? And 99% of the hands go up in those audience. People have switched off. The newspapers, are, are, their, their, their um, readership is falling off. They're trying to migrate into electronic means and uh, on the internet. But nobody's reading the newspapers as much as they used to. People aren't watching the TV uh, as much as they used to because they don't believe it anymore. I don't believe it. I've spent the last uh, 50 years of my life, 55 years of my life, watching news and current affairs. I don't watch it anymore. There's no point. I watch the headlines. You know how they're going to present the story. It's all propaganda. Uh, and you, what's important as well is the things that you're not told about. Uh, so I don't watch it. I get my news now from other sources. If I want to know about something, I research it. Uh, you can't trust the news media anymore. We need a complete cultural revolution in this party. Uh, sorry, in this country. We need to change everything. And the only way you can do that in a democracy is through the ballot box. So people have got to overcome their, their apathy and their um, distrust of politics. I perfectly understand where that's coming from, but if you don't give, and maybe it's not UKIP, maybe they want to vote for another party, but if you carry on voting Tory, Labour, Lib Dem, you will get the same things. And that's the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. One of the things that the, the media spend a lot of time on uh, and that we don't seem to talk about very often is public services, the health mm. service, the education service and so on. What kind of approach would UKIP have to running those public services? Well, we fully support the National Health Service, but we don't have a National Health Service, we have an International Health Service. It <coughs> cannot go on in its current form if you constantly bring in hundreds of thousands of people every year who have never paid into that health service and are on very low incomes or on benefits and therefore will not be able to support it. So a national health service should be for the population uh, that exists, uh, who are citizens of that country. And one of our policies is that anybody who enters the country uh, should have health insurance, otherwise they're not allowed in uh, because uh, if somebody's taken ill, obviously you're going to treat them and give them emergency service. But anybody that comes in as a visitor um, or to work on a work permit should be required to have paid for private health service. You know, if you go away on holiday, you wouldn't dream of doing that without taking out some health insurance so that if you have a problem, you're able to pay for it. So why would we allow anybody into the country? 
in the terms of the education system, again, all of our public services are suffering from, as Neil described earlier on, these massive um, amounts of population increase which they can't cope with and we can't actually pay the infrastructure to provide in time to meet those population growth numbers. And also what I'd like to see in the education uh, system is some way of actually depoliticising them because now they have been, you know, I talk to people around the country, I talk to sixth formers and college students who come to our meetings, they are being, uh, how can I put this, some of them have been verbally attacked, some of them have been physically attacked, people, kids at school have been told that their uh, UKIP uh, supporting parents are Nazis and fascists. This is happening in our schools and colleges and you've seen in universities now where people are being deplatformed, they can't speak if they're not in line with the politically correct cultural Marxist agenda of those institutions. I don't quite know how you'd stop that because it's spent the last 50 years being built up. How you could solve that problem quickly, I don't know, but somebody certainly needs to sit down and think about how we depoliticize our education system. We live in a very uncertain world and we've, we've um, encountered uh, in our lifetime a lot of major international incidents. How do you think Britain is prepared for its role in the wider world? We're not an empire anymore. We have an army now that's reduced to about 80 odd thousand personnel. Most of those, not most of those, sorry, a large number of those are not actually combat personnel, they're support staff. We can't, provo we can't perform that, uh, that function on the world stage that we used to have. We need a complete root and branch reassessment of what are our armed forces for. They're to protect our country and we, will only, we should only go into any kind of international um, military um, campaign if we're absolutely certain that's in our national interest. I'm a big believer in NATO and the core founding principle of NATO was if you attack one of our countries in, within the, in NATO then you attack us all and we respond and that protected us against the threat from the Soviet Union during the Cold War. I don't think it's the job of NATO to go in and have expeditions into other countries where we think they should have regime change or we don't like their politics. Look at the disaster in Syria. We didn't get involved in that, thank goodness, but who sorted it out? It was the Syrians and the Russians, I'm sorry to say, but what David Cameron wanted to do was to actually support the people, the extreme um, Islamic fundamentalists, who were causing the problem in the first place, under the guise that somehow these were reformers. Uh, you know, we had all this nonsense of the Arab Spring a few years ago, didn't we, promoted by the BBC, and look what mayhem and suffering they have caused in those countries. Uh, where they have propagated their message. So I think a lot of the time we should keep well out and let them get on with it. Thank you very much, Gerard Batten. You're welcome. Thank you. Good. Well, thank you very much, Chris. Okay. Thank you. If you want to support a return to proper parliamentary democracy and for Britain to unite to make a success of Brexit, Join UKIP today. Go to www.ukip.org or phone us on 0333 800 6800.